today. Um, uh, my name is Dr. Smith, and I've had the uh, privilege of uh, uh, both teaching and advising uh, Nathaniel Perlack for the last uh, two and a half or so years. Um, anyway, uh, he was able to uh, combine his love of mechanical engineering with something he's passionate about, which is uh, climbing, and so I'll turn it over to Nathaniel. Um, so again, this is my senior design presentation for a climbing rope inspection device. My name is Nathaniel Gerlach, and my advisor is Dr. Smith. So the key points that I'll be covering during this presentation will be a brief background of rope design and rope inspection processes, uh, design specifications and alternatives for this project itself, the analysis that was performed on the motor um, for this device, project management, prototyping, uh, the evaluation of the prototype, and finally the next steps that need to happen with this project. So the objective of this project was to create a motorized device that will allow users to thoroughly inspect their climbing ropes without missing any core defects or abrasion and to do this in a timely manner. Um, that may not make sense right now, but after we go through rope design basics, that will hopefully be clarified for you. So for modern ropes for climbing, um, they're made out of two parts and they're called kern mantle ropes. The kern is the core, which is the white part shown in the picture here. Um, the sheath is called the mantle, and that's the uh, outer colorful part that really is just there to protect the core. The kern holds up to 80% of the climber's weight during use, so that's really what you want to be inspecting when you're looking at a climbing rope. Um, there's two types of climbing ropes that are used in the world today. They're static and dynamic. Static is, uh, for the most part, somewhat rigid. It's hard to work with, and it's usually used for rescue scenarios and things like that. Dynamic is what this project is going to focus on because it's much more pliable, um, it's easy to work with, and it's by far what most climbers use. All right, so there's many, many ways to inspect climbing ropes. The one that I've chosen to compare my model to is this loop inspection method shown here. Um, so again, when you're inspecting a rope, you're looking for core damage. So when you hold the loop of rope in your hands just like this, you should, if there's no damage, get a nice uniform radius. Um, if there is core damage, however, the rope can't support itself and it'll actually collapse and form that point like in the right picture. So that's really what you're looking for as you feed the rope through your hands for a 60 or 70 meter rope. So the current process, uh, which is inspecting it by hand, is very time consuming. You can imagine how long it takes to feed inch by inch for a 60 or 70 meter rope. It's tiring on your hands, so it's very tedious because you're looking at the same rope for the whole process. And the majority of climbers ultimately don't inspect their ropes because it takes so long. That's obviously a problem. Um, so we need something that's faster, more efficient, and just as thorough as inspecting rope by hand. So some of the design goals for this project, as I said, it'll only be for dynamic ropes. It should be used for personal use or in climbing gyms like the one here on campus in the rec. It needs to be ergonomically friendly and comfortable to use. And it needs to be smaller than a three by five by nine box. Um, this was chosen because um, the grip is modeled after a flashlight, basically, um, that you can hold on to, just like you see there. And most medium-sized flashlights are about nine inches long. Um, the three by five comes from just it needs enough space to fit pulleys in it to uh, feed the rope. All right, so these are the actual design specifications for the project. The first one is that the device should be battery powered. This one's um, medium importance because, especially in climbing gyms, you're not always going to have um, outlets in the walls, so you can't just conveniently plug it in. Um, the next one is the device shall feed a loop of rope so the user can visually inspect it. This one is extremely important. Um, if it doesn't feed rope, you obviously aren't going to inspect anything. And at the same time, if it doesn't feed a loop of rope, I can't compare it to the hand process that I just mentioned. And the device really needs to have a built-in safety so that it stops if the user lets go. This is extremely important, especially in climbing gym scenarios. Um, in climbing gyms, ropes are typically fixed to the ceiling. So if you were to let go of the device and it doesn't stop, there's the potential of it running up the rope until it hits the ceiling. Um, that would be really hard to retrieve. Um, next, the device shall be able to feed ropes with diameters of eight to 11 millimeters. Those are just typical climbing rope sizes. You don't really see anything smaller than eight millimeters or larger than 11. Um, the device shall not damage the sheath during operation. That one's also very important. You don't want to damage something when you're inspecting it for damage. It's kind of self-explanatory. Um, the device needs to weigh less than five pounds. This is just to keep it convenient to use. You don't want it to be heavy or awkward. And the device should run slow enough that rope can be inspected thoroughly. This one's also pretty important. Um, if it runs too fast, the user can't really see what's going on with the rope. And if it runs too slow, they might as well inspect it by hand because they're not saving time. So now I'll go through um, the four design alternatives that were looked at for this project. 
The first one is the drill power concept. This features a cup-shaped housing that would fit over the chuck of the drill. The drill would provide the power to feed the rope through the pulleys on the left end. Ultimately, this design was scrapped just because um, it's not self-powered. You have to have a drill in order for it to work, so it's not very convenient. Um, the next one was the single pulley concept. This one I was actually a pretty big fan of. Um, it features, obviously, a single pulley with two channels for the rope to feed through. And this is kind of the end view of the device. Um, the rope would come in one side, make a full loop, and then feed back out the other. The one downside of this one is that when it makes that full loop, you're also putting a twist on the rope, which makes it really inconvenient to use because you'll have a tangled mess on one side. So that um, design was also bypassed. The next one was the double pulley concept. This is pretty close to the final design. You can see it features one drive motor in the middle, and there's two pulleys, each on the outside. Those outer pulleys are spring-loaded in order to accommodate ropes of different diameters. The spring allows the pulleys to move laterally. Um, additionally, you'll see the cover plate on the outside there. That'll swing into the front just to guard the pulleys while it's running and make sure nothing gets tangled in them. It's really more of a safety feature than anything. And this is the final design concept that I ended up going with. As you can see, it has that flashlight-shaped grip. Um, it has forward and reverse buttons, the red buttons there. And it also has a speed control knob right next to those. Um, it's pretty similar to the last concept. Like I mentioned, it's got that cover plate that'll swing in in front. This is an end view of the rope feeding area with the pulleys. You can see this one's a little bit different than the previous concept. Um, it features the pulleys that are they're up higher than the motor and they're also closer together. That's in order to um, put a tighter bend on the rope and it makes the defects pop out a little bit more. It's easier to see. And then the drive pulley is located in the middle. These pulleys, however, um, instead of being spring-loaded, I opted to go with something um, with material that's softer, like foam. That way the foam can compress. It's a little bit simpler than having a spring moving around inside the device. This is an another view of the um, pulley feeding area. You can see there's cutouts in the top and bottom just for the rope to be inserted, feed through the top, and then come back out the bottom. So just to clear things up, um, this is an animation. You'll insert the rope into the device, cover plate will close and then you can see that red band is going to feed the rope through the device so that's how it'll actually live while it's running all right so the reason I ended up going with that concept out of all of them is because it satisfies these um, design factors shown here safety is obviously the most important thing um, it should be easy to use with its forward and reverse buttons it um, provides good inspection ability just because it has that loop of rope that you're looking at, just like the hand inspection process. It has good ergonomics, um, should be easy to construct a prototype, and it achieves the design specifications. Um, next I'll go over the analysis that was performed on the motor for this device. Um, I had to find the required motor torque, the kinematics of the motor, which is velocity basically, um, static stress that would be placed on the motor spindle, and the fatigue of the motor spindle. So first was finding the motor torque. Um, just in general, heavy ropes weigh about um, 77 grams per meter. And from there, I assumed that people would hold the device about two meters off the ground. Obviously, most people aren't even two meters high. They're not gonna be able to hold it that high. Um, but I just wanted to assume on the safe side, make sure there's enough torque to get the rope to move. From there, the torque calculation is really simple. Just take the weight of the rope times the radius of the drive pulley, and you end up with about 0.17 inch pounds of torque that are required. Um, from there, I needed to figure out how fast the motor needed to rotate in order to make the device effective. Um, that was found by taping off a one-foot section of rope and feeding it through by hand um, multiple times and taking it a time average. And that ended up being about six inches per second. From there, I could convert that to how many revolutions per minute the motor needed to spin, and that ends up being um, about 114. So after contacting Hearst Motors, they were kind enough to supply me with a motor. Their motor was a 12-volt DC motor, which um, allowed forward and reverse operation, which is great for this device. Not all DC motors can do that. Um, it has 3.75 inch-pounds of torque that it can deliver, which is well above my requirement. The only downside is that it only rotates at 36 RPMs. Um, as far as prototyping goes, that's okay by me. As long as it feeds rope, I can always find a faster motor later on. Next is the static analysis on the spindle. So there's really three main forces that are being applied to this spindle. Um, I'll go ahead and just talk about the uh, layout of the motor here. This was designed in SolidWorks. Here's the housing of the motor, the, uh, the front plate of the motor, and then finally the spindle coming out the front. 
and the spindle is what the uh, drive pulley will be attached to in order to move the rope. So the three forces that are applied, the first is from the pulleys, the uh, compression of the thumb pulleys, and that total is about 29 newtons um, for both of them combined. Next is the weight of the rope. As you're holding the device, the weight comes up from the pile that you're inspecting, comes up to the device, and the rope comes back down. So you've got two strands of rope. So the total weight of that is about three newtons um, of force. And finally, there's that torque that we just discussed. So as you can see, um, the green arrows on this housing are to show that the motor is uh, fixed in place for the analysis. The purple arrows on the end of the spindle show the applied forces. And then finally, the, the colors in the spindle correspond to this um, graph on the right here. And that shows the stress level predicted in the spindle. The motor material was 4130 steel. That's just a pretty generic steel. Um, it has a yield strength of 460 megapascals. And you can see on that scale on the right, um, from the uh, SOLIDWORKS analysis, it's only predicting a max stress of 24.2 uh, megapascals, which is well below the yield strength. So there's really no concern for yielding. <coughs> um, the same stress analysis was also performed by hand <coughs> using von Mises uh, stress concentrations. <coughs> And um, as you can see, the, the hand results are 24.6 megapascals, which is extremely close to SOLIDWORKS. So I'm very confident with those numbers. Um, next, fatigue um, analysis was also performed in SOLIDWORKS as well as by hand using modified Goodman criteria. And um, those both showed that it would have infinite life, meaning that it will never, feel, never fail due to fatigue. Um, so then we get to the circuit design. Obviously, since there's a motor and it's going to be battery powered, we need some kind of control circuit. Um, so this is the a tentative uh, layout for production. You can see there's a potentiometer, and that really just adjusts the voltage potential that's available for the motor. Um, as you turn the resistance up in the potentiometer, the motor has less voltage to deal with. Um, next, it would go through an op-amp buffer. This would pro <laughs> provide a, um, a clean current going to the motor. And then finally, there's the motor on the right side. However, um, in order to make the prototype just simpler, just to see if it would even run, I ended up going with this circuit here. Um, it has two switches, one to act as a dead man switch, which is the one on the bottom that's open. Um, the one on the top is the double pull, double throw switch on the top left. And that is to provide forward and reverse operation of the motor. Next, we've got the potentiometer, which controls, again, the voltage potential. And finally, the motor. The problem with this one is that when motors are loaded, they automatically draw more current from their source. And when you run more current through that potentiometer, you also reduce the voltage potential for the motor. So in essence, you have the snowball effect. When you load the motor, you're actually reducing the power that's available to the motor. Um, next is the budget. As you can see, the motor, again, was provided by Hurst. Um, the speed controller I had on my own, so I didn't have to pay for that one. And the unit housing was provided by Venter Sheet Metal. So when you rule out the student faculty costs, the device only ended up being $76. All right, so um, on to prototyping. <coughs> to just make a simple prototype in the first place, I wanted to see if it could feed rope at all. I just took the metal plate shown on the right picture there and drilled holes into it to mount the pulleys. Um, the drive pulley is shown on the left, and it's actually just a gear with teeth in it to feed the rope. During the initial trial, the rope actually fed pretty smoothly. I was pretty excited about that, um, but the rope did not want to stay centered on the pulley, so it would hop off to either side. So next, you can just see these are pictures from the prototyping. The lower housing is all made out of one piece with an opening for the motor compartment. And here's the completed device, um, same one on the table here. You can see with the cover plate open and closed, and closed is how it'll be during operation. The only adjustment that I had to this is I added a guide wire in the bottom here. Um, like I said, the rope didn't want to stay centered on the pulleys. So that guide wire actually helps the rope to stay on the same plane as the pulley so it doesn't hop off to either side. So this is a video of it actually running. Um, overall, it feeds the rope fairly well. Again, it's slower than I would like it to be, but that's just because of the motor. Um, the biggest problem I have with this is that the motor, or not the motor, the uh, feeding is somewhat sporadic, and that's due to the foam pulleys. Those were cut out by hand, so they're not perfectly rammed. So to evaluate that, this is the same design criteria that I talked about at the very beginning. Um, everything got checks except for three categories. The first is the feeding of the rope. Obviously, like I just said, it's kind of sporadic, so I wanted to give that a check mind. It's not really where it should be if I were to sell it to anybody. 
um, the bike should weigh less than five pounds. It actually weighed in at 5.4, and that's due to its large size and it's also constructed out of sheet metal. Um, ideally, it would be made out of some lighter material like aluminum, and it's also obviously much larger than the, the three by five by nine. So for the next steps for the project, the drive gear needs to have more consistent teeth um, so it doesn't slip as bad. Also, again, the biggest problem was the foam pulleys. Um, really, they need to be made out of a soft rubber or something like that to have just a more consistent roundness and grip. And the housing needs to be machined. Um, you just can't get the accuracy that I need out of um, sheet metal. It needs to be machined. Um, finally, the more elaborate circuit needs to be, it needs to be refined, first of all, and then implemented into the device. And a faster motor needs to also be installed. And the last step would be applying grip pad. So I would like to thank Dr. Smith and Dr. Deersing for helping me with the design of the device and also for the circuit layout. Um, Donna Moore for keeping it on track. The rest of the USI faculty, First Motors and Ventura Sheet Metal for donating components, and Eddie and Jane Gerlach for uh, funding the project. Depending on cost, yes. Uh, patents typically aren't cheap, but I think it'd be worth it. Have you have you scheduled an hour or two hours of time to meet with Dr. Cuban to figure out that process? <laughs> Not yet. I've talked to people without patents, but I'm talking to him. He'd be a good person to talk to. Because from two perspectives, one, he's done it. Two, he could help you if you wanted to go through USI for some of the, the, the startup cost of that. Okay. So. I got a technical question for you. Yes. Um, your torque calculation. Yes. You you calculated basically the amount of torque required in a static way to raise the rope two meters and then drop, let it just be there. Right. Um, wouldn't the same? But it was only based on the weight of the rope. Wouldn't the same weight of the rope be pulling the other direction? Yes, that is um, one thing I forgot to mention there during the analysis. Because um, there's these three forces that are applied, they're not all acting at their maximums at the same time. If you think about it, the max torque is going to be when you're pulling up just one side of the rope. Okay. Um, the max weight of the rope is when you're going to have both sides of the rope actually hanging off the device. So that won't be at the beginning. And then the force from the pulley should be pretty consistent. Um, so yeah, that max torque is just for the very start up. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions?